Greetings from the Arizona Bach Festival's 2021 season. I'm Don Morse, the president of Arizona Bach Festival Board of Directors, and I'm happy to introduce the first of our Bach Talks. These are intended as a gift to our dedicated audiences and patrons outside of our regular performances, celebrating some of the greatest music of the Western tradition. The Bach Talks will be much in the format of our regular pre-concert lectures, but with concentration on a single aspect of Bach's compositional process, interpretation, the reception of his music in the last 275 years, highlighting his place within the larger cultural realm of Western Europe during his lifetime. The first Bach talk is presented by Dr. Craig Westendorf, another member of our festival board. His topic is invertible counterpoint. That's a rather formidable term, but one of Bach's most pervasive compositional devices. We hope this will be a short journey of your own self-discovery into the layers of complexity in his works. Dr. Westendorf taught music history at the University of Notre Dame and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. While at Urbana, he presented pre-concert lectures in the Cranach Center on campus. We hope the Bach Talks will sharpen your interest in our online virtual performing season. We're happy to have performers both beloved from the past as well as new artists to our roster, including organist Aaron David Miller, an extraordinary lute duo from Poland, and violinist Stephen Redfield, accompanied by Kathleen McIntosh, both on period instruments. We're excited through virtual means to hear instruments and take you to venues that would not otherwise be available. We hope you'd enjoy today's offering and we'll connect to our website for complete information about the Arizona Bach Festival 2021 concert season, as well as for watching for our postcard in your mailbox. Connect to ArizonaBachFestival.org. Very best wishes to you all. And now, Dr. Westendorf. Arizona Bach Festival Bach Talks. Uh, today's topic is invertible counterpoint, a rather formidable term, but I hope you will really love to understand it at the end of this demonstration. Uh, invertible counterpoint simply means writing at least two voices that can be interchanged. In other words, one voice can take the soprano, one voice can take the bass, and those can be flip-flopped. If you just have two voices, that's often called double counterpoint. If there are three voices, that is called triple counterpoint. If there are four voices, that's called quadruple counterpoint, which Bach does in fact do at the end of the Art of the Fugue. Um, getting beyond four voices, it becomes so thick, it almost is too academic to even listen to as, as a real piece of music. So we'll just start with some double counterpoint to start off with. Um, actually, you can in fact add a double counterpoint to any kind of tune. Now the safest way to proceed is simply to add thirds and sixths to the melody that already exists for you, and that will sound like this. Now if I do the uh, step of invertible counterpoint, the top voice of melody will become the bottom voice, and the bottom voice becomes the top voice, and that sounds like this. It's not really showing any independence of voices. It's more of a harmonization 
ultimately not too interesting, especially not what we expect from the greatest arts of counterpoint in the works of Bach. So, let's take it to the next step. The thirds and the sixths as a structure are very simple to work because if you take the third, this is E to a G sharp, for example, and if you turn that upside down, the G sharp is going to be on the bottom and the E is going to be on top. So turning thirds and sixths upside down is a very, very pleasant outcome and the most sure way to ensure the scaffold of invertible counterpoint. Now what I'm going to do is essentially take that scaffold of thirds and six and fill them out. So here's my second voice now to twinkle twinkle little star. It's gonna sound like this. century style. So anyhow, here is the original melody with the added voice. So notice on the main points of this little two-part composition uh, of an invertible counterpoint, I still have octaves, thirds and sixths basically. Six. So you can embellish that with dissonances. In other words, have these nice six and thirds and six and so on. I'm filling those out. as long as you treat it correctly, which usually means uh, dropping down one step. When you create a dissonance and go down a step, that's part and partial of really all of what we call functional harmony. A dissonant note dropping down a step to resolve itself. We have a lot of those instances here. For example, and it goes to that, but I have that nice descending motion so it resolves itself and so on. So here's the result of invertible counterpoint of this little twinkle twinkle star piece I just wrote. And now I'm going to flip it, the melody is going to become the bass, and my added voice is becoming soprano. some more examples of uh, invertible counterpoint, double counterpoint in two voices. Uh, this is another example I wrote, uh, this time more in the style of Bach. So here's our top melody for the beginning. Okay. And here's our second voice. upside down, so to speak. And likewise, that basic structure of thirds and sixths remains with some filling out in between. There's our biggest crunch in the piece, but likewise that distant voice goes down to the third. So let's finally go 
to the real deal. Well, this is one of my favorite examples of triple counterpoint, invertible counterpoint using three independent voices. This is the three-part invention in D major by Johann Sebastian Bach. And um, what I will do first of all is uh, just get the basic melodies that Bach uses. Here's the leading melody. which has a lot of balance, a lot of structure in itself, very dance-like, um, probably more like a bourree than anything. It just has one idea. Same thing down a step. Same thing down a step. And cast it off. And what I call the uh, second uh, melody is more of a running thing, again, using structures of thirds and sixths. Example that I just did a little bit of go, it fills that in. Very whole, very complete into itself, obviously. And some nice little chromatic inflections built in. So not only do we have that nice pregnant melody, so we also have a lot of harmonic interest that's really driving the piece forward. Now the uh, third melody has a lot of character into itself. It doesn't have that running pattern. It sounds like this. So here's that leading melody, the first melody with that third melody. the second melody. I'm going to play the third melody on top of that now. All function very well together. So that third melody kind of shows that descending three note idea. It's a very, very logical pair to the leading melody, just kind of reinforcing that stepwise descent motion. So that's how the three melodies present themselves. And what I'd like to do now is to uh, play the whole thing for you. And what I will show graphically in the by number three, two, one, I will show you how the voices come in. Uh, now in double counterpoint, you only have two possibilities of combining voices. Um, you have a top melody, bottom melody, that gets flip flop, bottom melody becomes a top, top melody becomes the bottom. In three parts counterpoint, we now have six possibilities, and that really, really adds the complexity. In other words, you can have one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, three, one, three, two, one, and three, one, two. And the amazing thing in this 25, 26 measure piece by Bach. Bach presents all six of those possibilities. Also, as you listen, you'll notice there is a developmental part in the middle, and that uh, develops what we call the head, the leading part of melody number one. So we are ready to hear the entire composition, and as that composition proceeds, I will show the order of voices as they come in.
triple counterpoint, invertible counterpoint, and three voices. The more you know about it, the more you will enjoy Bach. It is totally all pervasive. In fact, the introductory music you heard, which was the A major prelude from the Weltumber Clavier Book One, is also an example of triply inverted counterpoint. And it's such a lovely melody, you don't even notice it. That's the beauty of Bach. You have all these really intense contrapuntal devices going on, but you still just appreciate the motion and the beauty and the balance and the sense of climax and finality, especially in the example of the three-part invention that we just heard. Uh, we had that developmental section, and then all of a sudden, Bach has to get in the three last statements of the rearrangement of the voices, adding a real sense of climax and just a sense of closure to that. So, I hope you enjoyed this session, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you for joining us today for Bach Talk. If you're able and wish to contribute to our efforts in this season of new paradigms and venues, please log on to our website and click the support button. Your tax-deductible contributions will be automatically received. Remember, you can donate. You can become a sponsor of one of our concerts or one of our pre-concert lectures. And all the information you need is on the website. Or you can feel free to call the telephone number, which is also listed on the website, arizonabachfestival.org.